Assalamu alaikum. How are you all? Hope all of you are doing great. So today's topic is one of the easiest topic and one of the topics where the students score maximum marks possible because it's calculations, it's numbers. But you also have to learn how to write on it and the topic is financial ratios. Now before I start financial ratio, there are so many other ratios which I haven't covered in this video. The reasons are we are going to cover it later when we go through that topic because it might be very complex to start at the beginning of this course. So we are going to start with some basic financial ratios which you have previously known also and, and some addition to that. So starting with it, this is the main diagram, the map which we are going to cover in this video. All these ratios will be covered in this video from, from the beginning to the end. So as you can see on the top are the financial ratios. Then we are going to study what are the importance of the financial ratios. Now it's very important that we know why we are studying financial ratios. What are the importance? How financial managers are going to use these ratios? So we have four different branches. Profitability and return, debt and gearing, liquidity, investor. Just go across, okay, when I'm reading. So first we are going to deal with profitability and return. As the word profitability, you can understand it talks about your profits, how much profit you are making. Under that profitability and return, that is the first branch, we have three ratios. In fact, we have four ratios, right? ROCE, ROCE means return on capital employed, ROE return on equity, profit margins. In profit margins, we have two ratios. One is gross profit margin, the other one is operating profit margin. Okay, the formulas are given. You have to memorize the formula, you have to know the formula, right? Massive amount, 90% I would say, or 80%, 80 to 90% is calculations. So if you crack this part of the syllabus, I can guarantee you that you are halfway through it. You're halfway through the syllabus. That's how much important financial ratios are because it is throughout the syllabus you will get. Whether it is investor, whether it is in your investment appraisal, whether working capital management, everywhere ratios will be there. You have to deal with ratios. Okay. Moving on to the next one, debt and gearing. We have two ratios. One is interest cover. The other one is interest yield. Please make sure that you know the difference between interest cover and interest yield. We'll be explaining it. Okay. In this video. Because interest cover and interest yield is two different ratios, it's not the same. Okay. Third, liquidity ratios. Now, the reason why they haven't included any ratios under liquidity is because liquidity ratios, there's a separate chapter for it, which is known as working capital management. Under that working capital management, all liquidity ratios are there. I have picked up uh, three, uh, five ratios from liquidity ratios. Right. And there are more. More to that, which we'll be covering in working capital management when I explain you working capital management. Because starting now will make things very complex. We have to first understand it and then we have to study those ratios. Those I haven't included, but the easy ones, the basic ones, which is expected, yes, I have included. Then come to investor ratio, the last one. Investor ratio, very, very important out of the other three. Yes, other three are important, but investor ratio especially in financial management very very important you definitely will get ratios on this you there is no chance that you are going to miss a ratios on this so investor ratios for investor ratios there are three types okay dividend based earnings based tsr what is tsr tsr means total shareholder return okay so under dividend base, there are three DPS. DPS means dividend per share. Then we have dividend cover. Then we have dividend yield. Remember how we have for interest cover and interest yield. In dividend also, we have dividend cover and dividend yield. Okay. For earnings base, EPS, earnings per share and PE ratio, the price earning ratio. These two are under earning base and then your TSR, total shareholder return. You can take a picture of this when you are going to study the syllabus, when you are studying one by one. So this makes you easier for you to know where you are at the moment. What are the things you have to cover and where you are going towards. This is like a guidelines for you. It will be a guide. What are the areas you need to cover? What are the areas you are weak at? What are your strengths? What, the, what are the areas you have already covered? 
so keep this map in front of you throughout this video right when you are studying also financial ratios keep this in front of you this map next importance of financial ratios before going to in introducing the, you to the ratios what are the importance of financial ratios number one whether it's manager whether it's shareholder anyone we all are focused on what we are all are concerned about the progress of the company how much the company is progressing how can you tell whether this company has progressed or not what is the important objective for that company definitely every company wants to progress that's the reason why that company is operating right no one wants to be in a company where they're making a loss so progress is the key concern so how will you know whether your company is progressing or not if you don't have anything to measure that is through your ratio analysis that's why we have all those ratios through ratios we can tell that this company is has improved or declined for example let me give you a demo let's say you are in a company you are making 1 million pounds in revenue in 2019 and in 2020 you are making 2 million revenue double of it double the previous year so by looking at the figure the absolute figure one might think that okay this company has improved it has doubled its revenue but there are so many other things which has also which also took place right maybe the risk of the company has increased drastically maybe the liquidity position of the company is not good maybe the revenue has inclined but the profits are falling down right and and by looking at it it looks that you have increased by 50 percent but that's not the actual figure you have to compare it against something else that's why we calculate these ratios so let's say if you say that sales revenue is the uh, sales revenue to your uh, what do i say profit right has last year it was 20 percent this year it's 21 percent so even if you see it has increased by 50 percent in absolute terms the number wise the revenue the amount wise but when you're calculating in percentage wise in ratio wise it's very small so now you know why we are learning financial ratios the difference financial ratios gives you a better picture and it allows you to compare from year to year different years or between your competitors that's why it's financial ratios it gives things in percentage terms which is easier to interpret also understand also and easier for you to present also remember 1 million how many numbers you have to give such huge amounts so better to say in percentage time 20 percent 30 percent 40 percent how much how much your debt has increased like that so ratio analysis what happens is number one compare that is the job of ratio analysis you compare and it and it quantifies it gives a value quantify relationships between financial variables such as those variables what are the financial variables variables which you get the figures which you get in your profit and loss and balance sheet financial position statement of financial position right definitely we are using those figures only to uh, calculate our ratios right how do you calculate uh, return on capital employed right so all those ratios formulas are there we are going to see next financial ratios and ratio analysis are the key aspects within all of the following syllabus area i have told you how much important these ratios are because it is throughout the syllabus what what is it first it is helpful for this measuring the achievement of corporate objective that is our main priority in this video right the reason why we are learning ratio is for this only the number one the others we are going to cover later later on in our course when we actually finish this topic but now right now we are in this measuring the achievement of corporate objective that is a reason whether we have achieved our objectives or not we are going to measure it through ratios right so what is the primary objective let, let me give you let me explain this you through an example okay what is the primary objective of a company any company i've told you previously it is the maximization of shareholder wealth that is the main objective right but however see maximization of shareholder wealth is in the long run it's not a short-term objective no one wants to maximize shareholder wealth this year and next year they don't want to maximize come on it's common sense 
yes to achieve that long term objective that shareholder wealth maximization they set short term objectives like profit profitability level and targets they set like that to achieve that objective long term objective right and also this will help the managers to make a decision which area they need to improve which areas are uh, improving and why they are improving so they can continue on such activities and why something is declining you know so this ratios will help you to identify those areas for the managers and also it will help whether objectives are being met or not see definitely in the short term you are achieving what let's say profitability target you have said you have achieved that objective that means in the long run you are maximizing your shareholder wealth so your corporate objective has been achieved number 2 investment appraisal how can we use financial ratios in investment appraisal we are going to study a return on capital employed one of the financial ratios in this video so return on capital employed what does it do it is a way of appraising your investment when we are studying investment appraisal there we are going to use this ratios return on capital employed right and this is one of the most widely used financial ratios this return on capital employed so this return on capital employed will tell the manager whether they have to invest in a project or not if the return on capital employed is higher they definitely will invest otherwise they will not simple right next working capital management how are we going to use ratios in working capital management when we are studying working capital management this might be too early for you i am not going to go in depth of this but briefly i will tell you working capital management when we when we are going to study later on okay we have to assess this uh, length of cash operating cycle what is that operating cycle to get receive the cash length of cash operating cycle we have to calculate that length so when we are assessing that okay we have to calculate certain financial ratios there because without that calculating financial ratios it it is your data collection period or your payment uh, payable credit or payable period okay or your investor ra uh, turnover ratio all these ratios we have to calculate to calculate that cash operating cycle so there we are going to use it heavily but some of it i have included in this video some of the ratios of this and it needs to be compared against a benchmark this compared against a benchmark let's say your data is Okay, the standard, the industry ratio is that debtors are supposed to pay in 30 days. But in your company, it's taking more than 30 days. So 30 days is a benchmark. Your company is paying more than taking customer is taking more than 30 days to be. That means your company is not in a good position. That's how you compare. Okay. So now. let us go to the fourth one capital structure we have going to study capital structure cost of capital all all those all of these things we are going to study in this capital structure how are we going to use our ratios there one of the ratios which we are going to cover in this video of course we are going to relate it to the capital structure so be very careful when you are going through this financial ratios you will need it later on so make sure that at this stage you are thorough with the ratios and you understood the ratios completely and properly so that it will help you later on there you don't have to struggle okay and definitely ratios will come in your advanced financial uh, financial management level also right there we are not going to study all these ratios line by line how we are studying here so better this is the foundation you have to pick up from here okay so capital to gearing ratio gearing ratio is one of the very important ratio which you are going to study for the capital structure because capital structure comprises of two things no equity and debt so debt gearing with debt comes gearing right so that's why gearing ratio is very important it tells you about the risk of the business looking at the gearing ratio will tell you how risky your business is if the gearing ratio is high that means your business is very risky you have too much of debt definitely right too much of having uh, if you have too much of debt compared to equity definitely common sense it makes your business more risky because you have to pay more interest and you have the obligation you have to pay whether you make profit or loss they don't care you have to pay the amount of the loan and the interest so it makes your business more risky 
right and also before taking decisions such as sources of finance what are the sources of finance you can take all this depends on your gearing ratio if your gearing ratio is high you cannot take a loan simple as that because you are considered more risky by the finance providers so all those things you have to consider in capital structure because there we are going to study what are the sources of finance which are applicable to which you can go for right next business valuation so if you see we have uh, seven sections in financial management right so most of the section has all this at least five of out of seven at least five from your syllabus at least five of the sections contains financial ratios now you say how important financial ratios are. business valuation how are you going to use business uh, financial ratios in business valuation see any investor okay any equity investor who wants to buy your business okay will first see your financial ratios how your liquidity ratios your profitability ratio your investment ratios all those ratios they will see the potential investor the equity investor before they buy your business or before they sell the business they are not just going to buy it just because you want to sell does not mean a buyer will come and buy your business no way they are first going to review all your financial ratios before they actually buy it they want to see they want to draw on conclusions how much is the worth of the business based on the ratios so next this is the financial position why i have given here because all of our all of your ratios i'm going to explain it through an illustration through numbers by using this financial position and the statement or and the income statement that's why this i have included in the beginning of the video so that we are going to use all the figures all the ratios which we are going to calculate will be from this financial position and the income statement which is given here on your screen so please take a screenshot or write right so that later on when we calculate the ratios you know exactly what are the numbers i'm picking and how to calculate ratios how to know how to know which item to pick right and if you can see in your financial position two two years are given 2005 and 2006 this will be exactly the same way you will be given the two years will be given and you will be tell and you will be asked to compare which year is better what are, okay it's not just one or two ratios you have to calculate you can have a number of ratios so all of the ratios this in this video whatever the ratios i'm going to calculate is based on this financial position so you can take a look on this and please take a screenshot before you forget and ask me later on and comment me that how uh, miss ma'am how did i get this ma'am how did i get this figure so better you take a screenshot of this okay and even this statement of profit or loss that is also same two years are given and you can even see towards the end just go below and see down you are given the share price you are given the market value of loan notes the industry information you are given now why this industry information is given for you to compare they are the benchmarks you are given the industry p ratio industry eps and industry roe in percentages it is for you to compare right don't go and start commenting on the industry p ratios that it was this it was this no you have to compare with the results which you get for 2005 and 6 with this industry ratio i'm giving you some time so please just take a screenshot i hope by now you have taken the screenshot right even i have the screenshot in my phone so when i go i'll be seeing the figure okay okay done now starting with the first one profitability and return first okay all this will be in order order means let me take you back this diagram if you see profitability and return so first under profitability and return roc roe profit margins then i'm going to cover debt and gearing then liquidity ratios then investor ratios okay so that will be the order i'm going to follow that exactly the same order so you later on you don't get confused profitability and return this is most widely used by financial manager because they want to see the performance how much profit right and also this will help for the investment decision 
based on the profits. If an investment is making a huge amount of profit, definitely they will invest in that project. Next, an external investor will also monitor this ratios closely when deciding whether to provide the company with finance and to assess the value of the overall business. You see, even in the business valuation, we are using this ratios. Next, list of ratios. So what are the ratios? This already I have covered in the diagram, but again, to remind you, ROCE, return on capital employed, return on equity, gross profit margin and operating profit margin. These are the four ratios which we are going to cover under this. So starting with return on capital employed. You can see, okay. Okay, so return on capital employed gives a measure of how efficiently, this is just a definition, okay. A business is using the funds available. How efficiently? It measures how much is earned per $1 invested. Let's say if you have invested $10,000, how much you're getting in return? That is known as return on capital employed. The formula is given. Okay, you have to know the formula, memorize it. How will you memorize the formula? That's a good question for the people who keeps on forgetting. Who, uh, who does not have sharp memory to remember so much of things, how do you remember? So there's a simple thing which you have to do. Okay, keep on writing the formulas when you do a question. Okay, if pick up questions on this ratio, so return on capital employed. After definitely after you have finished this chapter, pick up questions, keep on writing the formula. Keep on writing the formula in, in a day until you remember the formula without actually writing the formula. You remember because initially it will be hard for you to pick up the figure from the balance sheet or income statement when it comes to do a formula calculations. You have to do calculations, right? In ratios. So first you have to know the formula, memorize it. Then start applying the numbers in it and finally the answer. See, answer does not matter initially or later. You will get the answer. Okay. You will get the answer correct. There is no chance. You are being provided with answers. So definitely you will break your head to get that answer. There is no doubt in that. Don't worry too much about getting the right answer. Worry too much about getting your formulas correct and remembering it until your exam. Even better if you can remember after your exam because anyway, if you are planning to take advanced finance, uh, financial management paper, AFM paper, you need this formulas there. Right? So, ROC, the formula is profit before interest and tax divided by capital employed. Multiply by 100 because it's a percentage. Now, you have to remember one more thing here. Not every ratio you have to multiply by 100 because not every ratios are in percentage type. Sometimes some ratios are in terms of times number of times stock turnover ratio so there are some ratios which are in terms of time some are in terms of percentages you need to know it so this you have to multiply by 100 okay mostly all the profitability ratios needs to be multiplied by 100 just remember this is the shortcut all the four ratios net profit margin gross profit margin roce roe all needs to be multiplied by 100 so profit before interest and tax PBIT divided by capital employee CE into 100. Now, what is this prof profit before interest and tax? If you see in your balance sheet, uh, sorry, income statement, just go before profit, before, inter before you deduct your interest and tax, that is known as operating profit. That's why they have given profit before interest and tax is equals to operating profit because that, so the figure which you have to calculate is definitely you will not be given their profit before interest and tax, right? In the income statement, they will not write it like that, profit before interest and tax. They will write it as operating profit because from operating profit only you deduct interest and tax and then later get your profit after tax or profit for the year. So the figure which you have to use, the numbers, when you take, that is your operating profit you have to take. Please understand this. Next, CE. Capital employed. How do you calculate capital employed? Most of the candidates go wrong here. Capital employed, they take, you know, some sometimes they they sometimes uh, invent something and they just put it. Capital employed. Most of the students operating profit they get it right, but capital employed they get it wrong. So ultimately your whole ratio gets wrong. So don't do this mistake. There are two ways of calculating capital. It's the same only. If you use logic. Because balance sheet needs to be balanced, so both the sides will be same only. Number one, you can take your non-current assets, add your current assets. That means your total assets minus your current liabilities. That is your capital employed. 
Remember, total assets, both non-current and current assets minus current liabilities. Don't deduct non-current liabilities. No, only current liabilities needs to be deducted. Or the other way you can do is, which is much easier and quicker to do, if you actually start calculating and see, you can see yourself, test yourself, okay? Both will give you the same answer only. Don't worry. The next one is the next line, the third line, share capital plus reserves plus long-term loans. So your long-term loans are your non-current liabilities. All non-current liabilities needs to be added with share capital and reserves. That will give you capital employed. So either the first or the second, any one of it will give you the capital employed. And you will get the same capital employed only. Don't, don't worry which one you have to take. So one of the disadvantages, what is it? You have to know the disadvantages and advantages of the ratios. Remember it because you have to interpret also. It's not just you calculate and keep as it is. Don't think like that. You have to interpret. That means you have to write about it. Compare why this ratio is improving, why this ratio is not uh, in this area, the business is not doing good. You have to give reasons. So you have to know the disadvantages also. You, The disadvantages is what is return on capital employed? I mean, which type of ratio it is? It is a profitability ratio. Profitability ratio means just check your numerator. It is using profit. So it uses profit. And we know when we are using profit, what happens? It is not directly linked to the objective of maximizing shareholder wealth. So profit, so whether your return on capital employed, it increases also, does not mean objective, your shareholder wealth has been maximized because it is using profit, no? And profit we know can be manipulated also. Unlike cash. Now, illustration. The reason I put illustration is I want to show you how to use. It's not enough for you to understand the formula and just keep as it is. You need to know how to use the figure and get the ratios. That's why illustration, I have illustrated everywhere all the ratios. So for 2006, I have told you clearly, please take the screenshot. So if you haven't taken the screenshot previously of the balance sheet and the income statement, go back to that part of my video and now you can take a pause and you can take a screenshot and then come back here because every time it will be hard for you to keep going back you know and coming here it's irritating but for for those who have the textbook the Kaplan textbook you can keep your textbook in front of you and go through it you don't have to take a screenshot this is for those who does not have a textbook okay so return on capital employee profit before interest and tax that means your operating profit starting with 2006. So operating profit in 2006 was 100 and 2006, I'm sorry. It's 340. 340. Remember the latest year was shown in the first column and the 2005 was in the second column. So most of you might have taken the other way around. 150 for 2006 and 340 for 2005. So don't do that mistake. I know that happens very frequently, but just make sure the latest year is in the first column. So 2006 operating profit was 340, 2005 operating profit was 150. Now going to the denominator. For denominator, you need the balance sheet, statement of financial position, income statement will not help you. This is the reason why I'm going through this illustration for you to know how to pick up from different places. All the ratios, when you calculate any ratio, not every number you will get from the same place. Okay, sometimes yes. Fully you will get from income statement, sometimes only the statement of financial position, sometimes both together you have to use from here and there. And that change from here to there needs to be very quick. You have to be very time efficient. That's why you have to practice these ratios very often before your exam because you have to be very quick at calculating ratios from different places you have to take figure. And this needs to be done very fast. You cannot take ages to decide what figure I'm going to take. Slowly you will go through each figure and then see, okay, this is the figure I have to take. You cannot be so slow. Remember the paper is time constant. You have a specific time you have to fill at that time. Right? And most of the students in financial management, it is written by the examiner. You can go and check the examiner's report later on. Candidates perform good in this part, the ratio part. It maximum candidates, they perform good. That shows that you also can do very good in those ratios. In fact, that is one of the reason why students excel or get such high marks in financial this paper. 
F9 paper. Okay. So now I'm going to go to the balance sheet and yes. So I'm going to go with the second approach. Ordinary share capital, share, uh, share premium and reserves. Remember, just because they told you in the uh, formula above share capital plus reserves plus long-term loans does not mean that if you are given a share premium you don't take share premium no you have to take the share premium also okay because share premium is also part of reserve only it's a capital reserve we all know that so share capital plus reserves reserves could be any type revenue reserve also capital reserve also so share premium is a part of a reserve okay so share capital plus share premium plus reserves which was which is 2000 okay in 2006 plus your long-term loan which is what is your long-term loan only that 10 percent loan note the rest two are current liabilities so only thousand so 2000 plus thousand same way for 2005 now let me take the second approach second approach let me take what is the second approach Non-current assets plus current assets minus current liabilities. So non-current assets in 2006 was how much? 1,800. Current asset was how much? Okay, so the total asset is given. 3,500. So 3,500 minus current liabilities. Current liabilities, if you see the loans and the other papers, together is 500. 200 plus 300, 500. So deduct that 500 from total assets, which is 3,500. So 3,500 minus 500 gives you 2,000. I'm sorry, uh, 3000. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My bad. Okay, so 3500 minus 500 is 3000. Now you go and check your denominator. Isn't it giving you the same answer? 2000 plus 1000 or 3500 minus 500. Both will give you 3000 only. So ultimately, it is 340 divided by 3000, which is 11.33%. Now, what's happening? See from 2005 to 6, the ratio went up or went down? It went down, which is not a good sign. You should be able to tell this. Okay, it's given also below that it has decreased from this to this, which is not a good sign. Okay, next. Return on capital employed. This diagram is given here because number of ratios. Okay. So this return on capital employed could be broken down like this. How it is broken down? Return on capital employed. Return on capital employed, the formula is net profit. Okay. Net profit divided by net profit divided by see net profit or oper uh, operating profit is the same only. Net profit, or operating profit, or profit before interest and tax, all these three are the same only. So don't get confused why now net profit there they are operating profit okay so net profit or operating profit divided by capital employed right that is the main ratio of roc now how can you break it down return on capital employed is the same thing as net profit margin multiplied by asset turnover so what is the formula for net profit margin net profit divided by sales revenue we are going to cover this later okay but from here also you can learn net profit margin Net profit divided by sales revenue multiplied by asset turnover. Asset turnover formula is sales revenue divided by capital employed. Now you see how the two ratios, if you multiply, you get ROCE. Next, the net profit margin could be broken down further into gross profit margin and operating ratios. So what is that gross profit margin? Same as net profit margin only. Here it is gross profit, there it was net profit, but the denominator is sales revenue only. Operating ratios, expenses divided by sales revenue. Here it is expenses, but sales revenue only. That's it. Okay. Next, asset turnover, if you see, this could be broken down into two working capital turnover and non current asset turnover. So, working capital turnover, because together it makes asset, right? So working capital, sales revenue divided by net working capital. Now, one thing I want to make, show you here. 
just see whenever that word turnover comes turnover okay always the sales revenue is in the numerator whether it's asset turnover working capital turnover or non current asset turnover so the word turnover means sales revenue is in the top divided by net working capital then come to the non current asset turnover same sales revenue will be on the top because it's turnover divided by non current asset so if it's working capital turnover turnover over working capital non current asset turnover turnover over non current asset understood and asset turnover sales revenue into capital employed right but you don't have to work out through all this and memorize all this table it's not needed it's just to show you that how this ratio could be broken down so you don't have to memorize this that's a good news next we are working towards return on capital return on equity return on capital employed and return on equity are two different two separate ratios okay so return on equity what does it do it measures how much profit a company generates for its ordinary shareholder not any shareholder ordinary shareholder why how do you remember its roe is for ordinary shareholder how do you differentiate between return on capital employed and return on equity it is simple just look at the word equity that e return on equity equity is for home equity holders or ordinary shareholders are the same thing only so whenever the return on equity comes for equity holders or ordinary shareholders okay the return is for them how much they have generated for them with the money they have invested in the company who have invested the ordinary shareholder so the word equity will tell you it is useful for comparing the profitability of company with other firms in the same industry so yes you can compare the profits of the other company with other firms in the same industry this ratio could be used now how it is calculated profit after tax and preference dividend now please understand why it is profit after tax and preference dividend there's a beauty of this once you understand how the formula is made up you will be it will be very hard for you to forget it you will remember it very much rather than just memorizing it you know profit after okay profit after tax and preference dividend divided by ordinary share capital plus reserves isn't it very boring how much you will remember there are so many ratios to remember so understand the logic behind this it will be more easier for you to remember you will never forget trust me on this so profit after tax and preference dividend why profit after tax and preference dividend because this is for equity holders or ordinary shareholders and ordinary shareholders they are the owners of the business they will receive everything after the interest and the tax has been paid and also the preference dividend the preference shareholders after they have been paid their dividends only ordinary shareholders will receive whatever they receive they will receive at the end after everyone all the creditor and the preference shareholders has received now you understand the logic why it is profit after tax and preference dividend definitely profit after tax means interest has been deducted that because obviously you deduct interest before you deduct tax first you deduct interest then you deduct tax then you deduct preference dividend you don't deduct you add because they said and so profit after tax and you add preference dividend with that whatever it is then you then the remaining is for equity shareholders divided by ordinary share capital now do you see it is for whom it is for ordinary shareholder so ordinary shareholder plus reserves plus reserves why because reserves could be capital reserves also right the share premium and all ordinary shareholders will get it multiply by 100 i have told you all profitability ratios multiply by 100 now they have given you another scenario where there are no preference shares what do you do don't go and hedge or try to fix it somewhere that preference shareholder dividend was given in the formula so i have to write preference no sometimes it's not given so don't waste your time hunting for it what do you have to do simple just profit after tax that's it there's no preference dividend so profit after tax that is pat divided by shareholder funds multiply by 100 simple now roe is similar to roc except so in all the other ways it is same it measures profit and all those things but in two areas it is different you need to know this difference very carefully because sometimes they might confuse you they might give you roe 
and you might think they have given you ROC because the scenario and I'm reading are not look similar sometimes you have to calculate return on capital employed but you have calculated return on equity looking at the scenario you might think like that that's why you have to be very careful when you read the scenario you need to know about those differences number one PAT that is profit after tax is used instead of operating profit return on capital employed what do we use operating profit return on equity profit after tax number one second shareholder funds are used instead of capital employed what did we use in the ROCE capital employed what are we using here shareholder fund shareholder funds mean only for the shareholders there we took both debt and equity here only equity that's it no debt no debt we are not adding that long non-current liability here only debt equity that's it that is the difference disadvantages of ROE there are two disadvantages of it before we go to the illustration okay first let's go to the disadvantages of return on employee return on uh, equity I'm sorry return on e equity what is it it uses profit same same whatever it is for return on capital employed it uses profit which is an unreliable measure because not directly linked to shareholder wealth see if some measure is not being related to shareholder wealth you can say that it's an unreliable measure you can tell next it is sensitive to gearing level how return on equity will increase as gearing ratio increases what did it say hmm? they told that return on equity will increase as gearing ratio increases next now we'll see same uh, income statement and balance sheet we are using so profit after tax divided by shareholders fund they have given you the formula also what is the profit after tax for 2006 please look at your income statement it is 190 190 in 2006 I'm just explaining you 2006 so similar you have to do for 2005 okay divided by shareholders funds what is shareholders funds just 2000 go to your balance sheet just 2000 you're not adding the thousand loan the thousand of loan you're not adding just 2000 okay so 190 divided by 2000 now you see what's happening from 2005 to 6 again the percentage is dropping ROE is falling now just go down and see what they have written the ROE is falling what is more if it is falling at a time when the industry average has risen from 12 to 15 percent what does it mean so they are not performing as well as the industry because industry average increased but they are falling down okay the industry average has been given to you below it's been given to you in your income statement the industry averages of ROE now you see how you are comparing with the industry rate averages also you are comparing between the time period 2005 and 6 also with the industry averages also with the industry average, when they have given such industry averages to you otherwise no need for return on capital employed we didn't do the same because we have not been given any industry averages but for return on equity the last item in your income statement statement of profit or losses industry average ROE 15 and 12 they have given you so when something is given to you it is understood that you have to use that figure and compare even in the exam you have to do in the exam you have to do this how do you understand when to take it will be given to you you have to use that if it's not given to you don't break your head searching for it like for return on capital employed they didn't give you any industry averages so be quiet but here they have given so compare uh, with each other and with the industry averages so it has increased from 12 to 15 what happens what does this suggest you need to tell you have to come up with answers like this what does this suggest don't just stop this increase this decrease that's it full stop no you will not get your full marks remember it interpretation interpretation is very important you have to interpret so this suggests that the company is failing to make the most of the shareholders investment shareholder they are not getting the enough return which they are supposed to get now 
this analysis accords with the findings of return on capital employed mpe ratio p ratio for time being let's forget about it when you have seen the return on capital employed also you have seen that it fell down this also fell down so it makes some sense right now imagine if return on capital employed increased return on uh, equity fell down then there's some sort of confusion that how this is increasing how every ratios which you calculate remember are linked they are interlinked with each other if it is affecting somewhere it will affect on the other places also wherever its impact is there if it's positively correlated if it's negatively correlated if something is increasing the other area it will de uh, decline that's how it goes all the ratios don't treat ratios in isolation remember every ratio needs to be compared then only that ratio analysis will be a meaningful analysis otherwise there's no use of study, uh, calculating ratios okay whether it is return on equity with this return on capital or whether it is investor ratios or gearing ratios or liquidity ratios every ratio are linked they should they shall be able to give the same conclusion one conclusion only you cannot say here it's increasing here is decreasing so you know where you are confused whether the company's performance is increasing or not understood so every ratio should give you the same picture same conclusion that is the whole idea next profit margin profit margin is the easiest it's easy we have studied it previously we have gone through it so this depend on the formula statement of profit or loss if okay so gross profit margin is gross profit over revenue operating profit margin is operating profit over revenue same multiply by 100 because they are percentages so what what will the, uh, this percentage uh, this ratio changes will tell you it will tell you about their cost control and the changes in operating gearing what is operating gearing we'll learn okay in some time we'll disclose what is operating gearing cost control how much you're controlling your cost will tell you let's say your gross profit margin has increased by a bigger amount but your net profit okay let's for example i will explain you this through number gross profit margin improved by uh, i'm sorry okay it improved by five percent but your operating profit margin only improved by two percent increased by two percent what does it imply it imply that even though your gross profit margin is improving you are not able to control your cost effectively you have to control your cost why because net profit margin where does net profit margin comes or operating profit comes from after you deduct your cost expenses from gross profit only so if your net profit margin is increasing very slightly compared to your gross profit margin you have to work on the cost control this will tell you that you are not keeping a control in your cost your expenses are too high you need to control it if it's the other way around gross profit margin is improving increasing by two percent but operating profit is profit margin is increasing by five percent that means you have a very good control in your cost but generally it is better better sign is that both are increasing if it's declining then it's not a good sign okay that means your profitability is being hampered next illustration so profit margin illustration both is being given in the same diagram so gross profit they will give you gross profit 700 and operating profit divided by revenue revenue has been given as 2000 right so if you see from 2005 to 6 it increased by 5 percent from 30 to 35 but if you see the operating profit margin it increased only by 2 percent the same example which i have given you the same example it's a coincidence if you see that my example is uh, matching with this right <laughs> because i haven't gone through this question this is the first time i'm going through this question okay so now next so we are covered with profitability ratios all the four ratios return on capital employed return on equity net or gross profit margin operating profit margin next moving to the second type of ratios debt and gearing here we have two types of ratios interest cover and interest yield so interest cover before that let us give us some background of this type of ratios it assess what risk profile you have to understand what each ratio measures in the profitability it measures profitability here debt and gearing measures risk profile okay not every ratio does the same thing assess the risk profile of the business next it is used by financial managers when taking 
which type of decisions financing decisions we have we learned in financial management in the beginning of this course i have explained there are three types of decisions a financial manager needs to take what is it can you remember recall okay let me tell you it is investment financing dividend decision three decision out of it financing decision is used okay debt and gearing ratio will help you to make your financing decisions how much to finance okay and also how much finance you can take next operating gearing we are going to study operating gearing here financial gearing operating gearing financial gearing two separate things we will we'll be learning it here okay and with the the formula interest cover and interest yield okay i have forgot to mention i wrote that interest yield over there so please mention it there interest yield also will come because in the map if you see in the very beginning the map which i have given you interest yield is there in the after the interest cover so operating gearing before we go to the interest cover and interest yield let us start with operating gear what is it if you see below the name the kaplan and the page number 543 is given so for you whoever is uh, struggling to get this you can go to page 543 and find this okay okay so starting with operating gearing the reason why i have copy pasted is i don't want to innovate this and put my own words you cannot do it also you have to explain it and present it as it is because these are ratios it will not change okay so operating gearing is a measure of the extent to which a firm's operating costs are fixed rather than variable as this affects the level of business risk in the firm operating gearing can be measured in number of different ways okay the definition i'm sure you will not you might not be able to understand so very clearly now leave it that's not important right now you focus on the what the the formula it could be two ways fixed cost divided by variable cost or fixed cost divided by total cost either way or percentage change in earnings before interest and tax divided by percentage change in revenue or contribution divided by earnings before interest and tax ebit means earnings before interest and tax please write it down before you forget what is ebit firms now please understand now you will be able to understand that definition from below firms with a high proportion of fixed cost in their cost structure are known as having high operating gearing what does it mean that means say you are in a business okay 80% of your cost you have cost right both type of cost you have fixed and variable out of it 80% let's say you have fixed cost 80% are your fixed cost only only 20% is variable cost that that means what that means you have a very high operating gearing higher the fixed cost in your structure cost structure compared to the total cost your operating gearing is high that's how you that's how you interpret it okay high proportion of fixed cost in their cost structure does if the sales of a company vary if the sales of the company changes what happens the greater the operating gearing the greater the ebit variability earnings before interest and tax okay the level of operating gearing will gearing will be largely a result of the interest in which the firm operates so whether operating gearing is high or low depends on the industry in which that firm operates some industry high operating gearing yes it is like factories on all of you see factories manufacturing site most of the cost are fixed you have a machinery over there fixed machinery will be there in that place you have the rent of the factory lights electricity all these things has to be given the salaries you need to give to the factory all those are fixed in nature you cannot do it you cannot change it so some environment operating gearing is very high based on the industry okay now coming to the next type of ratio the financial gear the financial gearing ratios this is a measure of the extent to which debt is used now financing financial has to do with always when you see the word finance or financial or whatever it is link it to the debt it will be more easier for you to understand the difference between operating gearing and financial gearing operating is fixed cost operating gearing financial gearing is debt understand it this way 
So financial gearing is a measure of extent to which debt is used. How much debt is used in that capital structure? Which capital structure? Debt versus equity. Okay. If you are having a high percentage of debt compared to equity, you have a higher financial gearing. Note that preference shares are usually treated as debt. See chapter on the source of finance for logic. So right now we are not going through that source of finance because later on we'll be going through that. Okay. So we are not going to explain it. I'm not going to explain it here right now to you. But for, for time being, just assume preference shares are treated as debt because you might be thinking that the word share is there, right? Ordinary share, preference share. So they are shares, they are equity. No, preference shares are treated as debt. Okay, so when, so when I explain you source of finance, we'll understand it better. Right now, assume it as debt. That's it. It can be measured in number of ways, three ways. Equity gearing, total or capital gearing, interest gearing. If it's equity gearing, long-term debt plus preference share capital divided by ordinary share capital and reserves now for you to memorize this how to memorize this how to how to because there are three separate things you might take one of this with the other one you might get confused between the three and mix match between those three right so in order for you to not to do that mistake i have a i have a way of figuring it out well just remember the word just remember the three words. Don't remember the formula now. What are the three words? Number one, equity gearing. Number two, total or capital gearing. Number three, interest gearing. Every word has gearing at the end. So the first word is equity, capital, and interest. That's it. For time being, remember it like this. So equity gearing. The word equity gearing means in your denominator, the word equity will be there. Everything will be for equity shareholders. Understood? So ordinary share capital and reserves, always reserves will come with share capital. Remember that. So don't always include reserves. So forget about reserves. You don't have to think about reserves. Just remember ordinary share capital or equity share capital. So the word equity gearing will tell you in the denominator, we have ordinary share capital. Reserves anyway, you have to add. Okay. Now go to the top part. Equity gearing. How do you get equity? After you deduct, you take your, it's a gearing, right? So gearing means top part will always be de debt. Whether it's equity gearing, whether it's capital gearing, whether it's interest gearing, all the three types of gearing will have debt on top. Remember that. So top part, long-term debt. This you can note down somewhere, whatever I'm saying right now. Or you might take a, from this part onwards, you can take through your phone a video of this so that you remember it. When you actually come to remember or memorize it, this shall help you. Because this are some few very small tips which I can tell you how to memorize. Okay, because most of the people when I used to give exams and all those things in school, childhood, I used to use these techniques and all. I always used to make things easier for me to memorize it. I never memorize things as it is. That is one thing which makes me, which... Uh, you know, so when it comes to memorization, Alhamdulillah, I can never be wrong. I never, I very hardly you can say. Maybe 0 0.001% I get wrong. But when it comes to memorization, something formulas or numbers or something, I've never forget. I never forget. Because I make such a way to remember that I never forget. In the long term, I think of long term to remember things. I try to bring logic somewhere, you know how this how to memorize this formula so i'm teaching today i'm teaching all this techniques to my students right it becomes very boring when you have when someone tells you okay this is there in front of you now memorize it, it becomes very boring until you explain someone why it is like this why it is the way it is something needs to be understood very properly from the depth then only you can have that interest and memorize it also for the long term Okay, so write it down somewhere, take a screenshot or you can send to your friends also who is not having access to this video. This technique which I am telling you to memorize, not only for this, throughout your life you can use in any field. Remember it. Make things easier for you to remember. Some people might find some other way of making things memorize it. That If that works for you, go ahead. Because not everything works for everyone, right?
but never mind again uh, coming back to the topic equity gearing so equity gearing equity means equity shareholders ordinary shareholders will come in the top down gearing means debt remember so debt will come in the top whatever gearing it is operating gearing financial gearing whatever so equity gearing means only for equity holders that means long term debt plus preference share capital the gearing when you have to take long term debt always long term debt plus preference share capital so this will remain fixed long term debt plus preference share capital long because preference share capital we treated as debt so that also will take remember debt also when you take not short term debt you cannot take short term debt for that we have another another uh, formula that is interest gearing long term debt only plus preference share capital okay understood the first one second total or capital gearing if you see the numerator same only long term debt plus preference share capital now do you see if you memorize one thing you can memorize the, all the other three so you don't have to memorize each one no takes time also always try to save time wherever you can always try to find efficient ways of doing something more faster in a more smarter way that's the fun of the studying you know? so if you see the equity gearing and the second one capital gearing both has the same numerator so you don't have to memorize twice if you memorize once you know long term debt plus preference share capital divided by now it is not equity gearing so equity shareholder will not come it is capital or total gearing so what will come total gearing total capital total long term capital understood total long term capital interest gearing interest is what interest comes when when does interest comes this is a little different the third one if you see let me give you the logic why it's different interest gearing okay interest how when do you pay interest on long term loans right you pay interest but interest it's a short term you pay for 12 months if annual you pay so interest you don't take as long term it's a short term short term debt so so short term debt you hear if it's a short term debt you cannot take long term debt and preference share capital you have to take the debt interest because interest itself is a debt so you have to take as it is for interest gearing interest gearing debt interest remember it like that it's short term okay so debt interest divided by interest gearing you cannot take capital or anything you have to take operating profit before interest and tax okay interest gearing interest comes in interest comes where income statement so you have to take both the figure from the income statement that's how you understand it so that's why operating profit before interest and tax okay so third one you have to memorize a little that profit before interest and tax rest all it is understood okay so i i hope this shall help you to remember it next interest cover so the second one interest cover after we studied operating gearing and financial gearing this video might be a little long compared to other uh, lectures of mine the reason is because i'm explaining stopping in between explaining you and also we are calculating so this might take a lot lot of time okay so interest cover interest on loan stock or debenture stock must be paid whether or not the company makes a profit understood right interest you have to pay so interest cover the formula is operating profit before debt interest and tax now do you see if if i go here previously just check the two formula interest gearing and interest cover just check the formula do, can you see there is a relationship what is the relationship debt interest went down operating profit before debt interest and tax came up just check this is the way you memorize interest gearing interest cover and interest yield there is a relationship between these three so operating profit before debt and interest and tax comes up debt interest goes down that's it understood why is it operating profit before interest and tax why not after interest and tax why, what's the reason because my dear friends profit after interest and tax goes to equity shareholders remember that profit after interest and tax whenever pat is given remember that means it is for equity shareholders so whatever interest cover interest you have to pay to whom to your debt holders 
so it is before interest definitely if it's before interest means before tax also because tax you deduct after interest right so that's why whether it's interest cover whether it's interest yield whether it's interest gearing all these three remember it's before remember the word before interest okay so operating profit before interest and tax divided by debt interest it's just the reciprocal interest gearing again i'm showing you interest gearing and interest cover just the reciprocal now interest cover is the measure of the adequacy of the company's profit related to interest payments on its debt that means how much of its profit they are able uh, being able to pay as interest okay higher this ratio is interest cover better it is that means you are now you can use that profit to pay your interest understood lower the interest cover greater the risk that the profit before interest and tax will become insufficient to cover the interest payments that means if your interest cover is low what does it imply that you are not being able to pay the interest payment with that profit before interest and tax which is not good if it's high it's good so high level of interest cover is good but may also be interpreted as company failing to exploit gearing opportunities to fund projects at a lower cost than from equity finance what does it mean what does it mean i'm writing it again it might be interpreted as good but always remember something cannot be good 100% good there must be some drawbacks to it so the drawback is what high gearing is good sorry high interest cover is good but what happens gearing opportunity they are missing out on the opportunity what is the opportunity lower cost them from equity finance now this briefly i will tell you here when we are going to study the cost of capital that chapter where we are going to study the equity finance debt finance and all those things we are going to study in depth but here for briefly debt finances are always lower in terms of cost they cost lower than equity finance the debt finance okay why is that because for debt finance the interest is tax deductible what does it mean higher your interest right higher your interest higher you have to pay the tax because you deduct what you deduct your tax before you deduct your dividends okay i'm sure you will not be able to catch up right now but later anyway we are going to cover it so till then we can keep it but for now you understand that debt always cost lower than equity finance because for de for for, for uh, we deduct tax from the interest which makes it cost lower but from dividends which we give to ordinary shareholders or equity shareholders we don't deduct tax so so dividend is not tax deductible that's why it cost more but interest is tax deductible we deduct tax from the interest right so that's why the debt cost low so now high interest cover means your debt must be low your debt must be low that's why your interest cover is high but that shows that if it's high that means you are not taking enough of debt in a enough amount of debt in your capital structure because through debt you can reduce your cost even further than using equity finance so there you are missing that opportunity even though having high interest cover is good so the interest cover ratio is the inverse of the interest gearing ratio can you so inverse opposite just ch change it upside down the illustration let us go to the illustration interest cover now if you see the interest cover ratio just 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 see the ratio it's not multiplied by 100 it's not multiplied by 100 what did i tell you all profitability ratios be multiplied by 100 but this we didn't multiply by 100 it is times how much of times okay let us go back to right okay so this we did multiply multiply by 100 okay let me go to the income statement let me open it in my phone mm. okay so operating profit because definitely profit before interest and tax means operating profit only 
operating profit divided by your interest interest is 100 income statement is given so 340 divided by 100 so if you see the interest cover increased from 2.5 to 3.5 it's good or bad it's good it's good so what does it imply the company is in a strong position you have to remember after you write you have to write this sentences also down company is in a strong position in terms of payment of interest so profit would have to drop considerably before any problem of paying interest arose. that means before you have the issue or problem of paying interest your profit should reduce drastically otherwise we're in a good terms because if you see your debt see the denominator in 2005 it was 60 now it's 100 the interest so your interest increased but your profit increased right profit also increased from 150 to 340 which is good but if it reduced drastically you will be having a hard time to pay the interest tax interest yield the fourth one under under debt or gearing ratio what is interest yield the word interest yield so interest yield we have dividend yield also the same way we have interest yield we have dividend yield also okay so interest yield is the interest of the proof under it expressed as percentage of the market price express as percentage of market price it is a measure of return on investment for the debt holder so that interest yield that means in okay divided by market value of debt if you have a bond or a loan you have a market value for that right for loan or bond or whatever you take that market value of debt okay we are talking about that market value so interest divided by that market value of debt you'll be given all this in your uh, thing so you don't have to worry about finding market value of debt or something and interest you just have to write it in the formula and find the percentage okay if you see the illustration here so the interest is 10 okay how much is the interest it's 10 for both divided by market value of debt how do you get this 10 by the way remember this interest is not that interest which is there in the income statement that's why you must be confused that before it was 60 and 100 how it is 10 here what did they tell the interest yield is the interest or the coupon express as a percentage of the market price or the coupon rate the interest or the coupon rate so how do you find that 10 now just go to your balance sheet statement of financial position if you see there what did you see did you see that there's a 10 percent loan note 10% loan note under non-current liabilities so that 10% that 10 that is the interest that's why you are taking 10 for both the years 2005 and 6 okay it's 10 okay that 10% that 10 you are taking if it comes to interest yield only I'm telling you this okay divided by market value of debt how do you get market value of debt they have given you the under note also how they got that 10 this is calculated based on one block of debt nominal value into 100 so nominal value is equals to 100 or can be calculated using the total interest payment and the total market value with 10 percent loan notes interest on one loan note is 100 into 10 percent so the nominal value is always 100 okay on that 10 percent because loan note is 10 percent so on that 10 percent will be dot 10 only that's how you get interest as 10 now market value of debt what is the market value of debt how do you get the market value of debt it's given to you if you go to income statement after profit and loss carried forward is given below after share price market value of loan note so that market value of loan note is your market value of debt only what is the debt loan note so 130 and 120 it has been given to you right now we'll see the second para under note why it has declined from 8.3 to 7.7 .7. the reason for the decline in the interest yield you now 
when you are studying ratios remember the reasons also try to understand the reasons learn from the answers which they have given because it's very hard for you to come up with a reason right so understand the reasons they have given try to learn those reasons so if you get such questions you'll be able to give similar reasons so the reason for the decline in the interest yield is nothing to do with the company definitely because interest is set by whom that 10 percent is set by the bank market value of debt the market decides that value of debt it's not in the control of a company so that's why the interest yield has nothing to do with the company because company does not decide here anything nor they can manipulate anything here so instead it reflects a moment in interest rates in the market and particular risk free rate it depends on the moment in the interest rate how the interest rates are going up and down so debt investors will still be interested in the level of interest yield as it will help them to assess whether the level of return is sufficiently above the risk free rate they want to see whether that interest yield is above the risk free rate they will give you the risk free rate let's say risk free rate is 4% so that means compared to risk free rate this is good because still even it fell from 8.3 to 7.7 it's still above risk free rate 4% right because if something is not above the risk free rate that means what they are not compensating you for the risk you are taking right you are taking a risk by investing so so the return also has to be above the risk free rate remember that that's why debt investors will be they will have a concern on in the interest yield next this is also this ratios are also very easy okay working capital ratios liquidity ratios and by the way the chapter which i'm using for explaining financial ratios chapter 19 but for this working capital ratios i have taken from chapter 7 working capital management because this were not given in chapter 19 if you see the page number is 184 so go through and you can take it so two ratios which is important here is current ratio and quick ratio so and it has says short term liquidity liquidity comes in short term okay nothing to do with long term higher ratio is better higher ratio means higher liquidity first is current ratio current ratio means current assets divided by current liabilities okay that means how much of your current assets are being used to pay your current liabilities usually they have given that two is to one means good if you see this is also not in terms of percentages okay so two is to one is good that means what two of your of your current assets is used to pay one current liability which is good that means you will be left with one right one one is also good two one is also good so current liabilities can be paid twice over the existing current assets that's good after you have paid your current liabilities still you will be left with current asset because you have twice the current asset compared to current liability which is good if it was the other way around one is to two that means your current asset is one current liability is two which is not good because you are not being able to pay your current liabilities with all your current assets that is the condition of you having liquidity issues and all where you have to borrow you have to take a loan to pay your liabilities and all and all those issues next next ratio is quick or acid test ratio similar the only thing is you deduct your inventory from current assets that's it so current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities here what does it measure how well current liabilities are covered by liquid assets please mark the word because you will get you might get this for multiple choice questions okay it is not current assets this time it is liquid assets liquid assets must see inventory why they deduct inventory because inventory is considered to be something which is not so liquid you cannot change inventory to cash very quickly it takes long amount of time for you to sell the inventory and then receive cash you know so some of the inventories are from ages then the warehouse only so that's why you deduct it compared to your data and cash data yes you can get cash and cash you have so those are known as liquid assets okay next second bullet point explains it is particularly useful where inventory holding periods are long and therefore distort the current ratio yes that's what i've told you if the inventory holding periods let's say the stock is there for the long time in the inventory warehouse what happens you're not having the cash that means it will distort your current ratio current ratio says is good 
you're in a good performance liquidity issue why because you have included inventory over there in current assets but if you take the quick asset trace ratio you will be able to figure out that actually is not the case because your inventory is not cash now you cannot use inventory to pay your current liabilities until you sell that inventory and get cash so measure one one means that the company is able to meet existing liabilities if they all fall due at once one one is good but it is not advisable why because in terms of hard times remember not every day is a good day an easy day smooth day right you might have to face some rough days so you have to be prepared for that rough days it's better to have higher assets than liabilities generally two is to one is an ideal ratio it's known as an ideal ratio two is to one okay so if you see some notes below they have given quickly we can go through it liquidity ratios are quick uh, sorry a guide to the risk of cash flow problem so what does liquidity ratio measures it measures the cash flow it's what is about the cash flow issues and insolvency if a company suddenly finds is unable to renew short term liabilities if the bank suspends its overdraft there will be a danger of insolvency if the bank does not grant them overdraft they will have an insolvency issue unless the company is able to turn enough of its current assets into quick quick cash quickly in general high current and quick are considered good why because it means they have the resources to pay back their liabilities but you have to also make sure i have told you previously nothing is too good everything has its drawbacks even if something is good it is losing somewhere so it indicate that working capital is not being used efficiently if it's too high because too much of cash is lying idle you're not investing it rather you invest the cash and get a return so what happens when you invest that cash your current assets will fall down because cash will be deducted from your current assets if you are having too much high asset ratio or current ratio right moving on to the next this are some of the ratios which is uh, generally required they will be asking you but this does not come in your uh, what do i say liquidity ratios this i could say efficiency ratios how efficient you are in managing your working capital this i have taken from the chapter working capital management chapter 7 inventory holding period receivable collection period and payable payable period okay so three ratios i have taken investor uh, sorry inventory holding period how much inventory are holding so the length of the time inventory is held between purchase and sell it is calculated as an inventory divided by cost of sales into 365 okay so for inventory it is the closing inventory they are taking okay so inventory if you have to get you will get from your balance sheet what is the inventory inventory is 1000 oh, sorry i'm sorry okay it is inventory divided by cost of sales into 365 why 365 because when you have to calculate number of days you multiply by 365 okay so let us find the inventory Mm. Okay, this is. I'm sorry. This is from a different chapter. That's why the illustration I will not be able to explain. That is not the same because this is a different chapter wise, right? So that's why the figures are uh, not matching. So you cannot use the same income statement and balance sheet. So let us forget about the illustration. That will go later on. Okay. So in some questions, a more detailed breakdown of inventory may be provided with raw materials, work in progress, finished goods stock. Okay, all these things. Okay, when the inventory is for raw materials, work in progress, finished goods, we'll be explaining in chapter seven when we are going to study working capital management. It's not needed here, so I have excluded it. Next, we have inventory turnover. The same way, inventory. See, inventory holding period. That means number of days. Inventory turnover means it's not number of days. Turnover means number of times. This you have to understand. because most of you get confused between inventory turnover and inventory holding period holding period means period number of days the period 
turnover inventory turnover number of times okay so for each ratio corresponding turnover ratio can be calculated this is the same can be used for receivable and payable also we have receivable turnover payable turnover and all those things okay so inventory turnover number of times the formula is cost divided by average inventory hold okay generally this is less useful in the examination okay so they have given you some but we, uh, this is from different chapters so we are not using the numbers here moving on to the next receivable day trade receivable days means you have to multiply by 365 that word day says that you need to find number of days okay it is a length of time credit is extended to customer how much within how much days customers are paying you so receivable divided by credit sales don't take total sales why because some of the sales are in cash if it's in a cash sale you are in a danger why see because cash sales when the sale is happening the customer is paying you the cash so there's no receivable it's closed down receivable only comes when your sales are on credit and they have yet to pay you your customer that's why only credit sales so receivable divided by three uh, credit sales into 365 days what does it say shorter the credit period I mean, that means shorter the number of days better it is that means your customers are very quick in paying you but it also depends on the nature of the business some of the business it takes longer customers take longer to pay some they pay shorter again you have to check the industry okay it will be depends on the industry but generally shorter credit periods are good trade payable day okay average period of credit extended by supplier how much we are taking time to pay our creditor our uh, payables supplier so trade payable divided by credit purchase same how we did for receivable credit sales this is credit purchases okay into 365 days now forget about the illustration when we go through the chapter we'll explain the we'll go through the illustration so generally speaking uh increasing the payable days such as advantage has been taken care of but credit there are risk is being sorry i'm sorry uh, such as uh, advantage has been taken of available credit but there are risk. see that saying that increasing payable day is good for us why because we are taking more time to pay a supplier that means what we are having the cash in our hand for a longer period of time which we can use for our business but it has a risk what are the risk three risk the longer you we take to pay a supplier losing the supplier goodwill the supply the goodwill which we have that we are pay we are the prompt payers we pay on time we'll lose that goodwill number one number two prompt payment discount we are not going to get any discount since we are paying late number three suppliers increase the price to compensate they know that if we are late on our payment supply will increase the price because they need to be compensated right that we are paying the unlit in short relationship will be affected with the supplier they will not give us credit later later on future so you have to think about the risk and the benefit and see whether it's advisable for to increasing payable days good or not when you have to comment on something please check that uh, check the pros and the cons both ways you have to see next investor ratio before going to investor ratio i want to give a break over here 5 minutes okay i will also quickly go and have my coffee tea and return in 5 minutes until then you absorb all the things which i have explained till now and this is the last type of ratio for the day so you also take a take some food and rest and then we'll go on to the investor ratio see you in 5 minutes
Hello, hello. So I'm back. Are you guys back? Okay, now. So I have had my cup of tea. Now we are coming to the investor ratio. It's morning 8.33 here, right? So this is my breakfast time. That's why I had some, you know, coffee and tea. So that now I'm fresh, energized, and I can explain you better. Okay, so coming to the investor ratio. Investor is interested in two things. One is income. One is the return on the investment. Okay, we are going to study both aspects. For the ordinary shareholder, these are the relevant ratios. They have divided in two groups. One is dividend, one is earnings. Under dividend, we are going to study DPS, dividend per share, dividend cover, dividend yield. Earnings, we are going to study return on equity. We have already covered return on equity. EPS, earnings per share, and P ratio. Okay. So in general, the higher each of these ratios are, the more attractive the shares will be to the potential investors and they'll be more confident in getting the return from the shares. All the ratios, all the six ratios, the higher it is, the better it is. Shareholders will want information on the total shareholder return. Okay, what is this total shareholder return? Will I will explain you after we covered all those ratios. So for a debt investor, they will be interested in the interest yield ratio. Debt investor. Remember, we have calculated interest yield. It comes in the profitability, uh, sorry, in debt and interest also. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Debt and gearing ratio also and in investor ratios also. Interest yield comes in both ways. But since we have covered it there, I'm not going to cover it here again, right? Debt investor. Next, EPS. Very common ratio. You have to learn this very thoroughly because in your AFM, heavily this EPS is used there, very heavily. And also in IR, other your financial reporting and strategic business rep uh, reporting, all this paper, EPS is needed. Okay. This is the basic measure of the company's performance from an ordinary shareholder's point of view. Whenever earnings per share, okay, this is for whom? Ordinary shareholder, not for debt holder and all. It does not include debt holder. Only for the ordinary shareholder point of view, what is the performance? It is the amount of the profit in cents attributable to each ordinary share. So the principles of calculating UPS is simple. What is it? We have, I have told you earnings per share. That means what is the earnings which will be given to the shareholders? How much of the earnings the shareholders will receive? The ordinary shareholders. That's why what is that earnings will be? Shareholders receive at the end. I have told you previously. So it will be profit after interest, after tax, after preference dividend because preference dividends I have explained to you previously. It is calculated, considered as debt. Why? will when we go through cost of capital we'll explain you there okay in detail so profit after interest tax and preference dividends pat short okay always for ordinary shareholders whenever it comes it comes after interest and tax that way you memorize it, remember it divided by it's for whom ordinary shareholders so number of ordinary shares in issue per share not shareholder so ordinary shares in issue number of ordinary shares so EPS can be analyzed by studying the growth rate over time, trend analysis. You can see over the time how much EPS has improved. One of the disadvantages of EPS is what? It does not represent the actual income of the shareholder. It uses earnings which are not directly linked to the objective of maximizing shareholders. We see earnings, profit. They are not linked to the maximizing shareholders wealth. They could be manipulated easily, right? So that's why it's not an actual income of the shareholder. But nevertheless, we still calculate such ratios because it gives an idea, basic idea, even though it's not very accurate. Illustration of EPS. Okay. Now, before I go to the illustration, let me give you some, uh, some more things about EPS, which you need to know that this ratio is simple in principle, the EPS. But in practice, when you go in reality, in practice, EPS is, it has a lot of complications. Because the definitions of earnings and shares changes. It's not the same. They don't have a standard definition of earnings and shares. That's why a careful analysis needs to be done. Okay, and sometimes we know that earnings could be manipulated. 
so accounting treatment can cause the ratios to be distorted because sometimes earnings figure might include some extraordinary item okay let's not go into the depth of what are those external extraordinary items but let's know that it includes and when calculating eps one drawback you have to know another drawback let me go previously okay you need to know is that you cannot compare eps of one company with eps of another because the way they calculate earnings one company might be different from the way the another company calculates their earning okay so the answer will be meaningless first what you have to do you have to calculate the growth rate of the eps how much the earnings per share is growing and then compared with the growth of similar company similar to you then you can compare okay so eps don't think that it is the income of the shareholder no does not because they say earnings per share so it's not the income for the shareholder but it represents the investors share of profit okay after tax generated by the company according to what are we saying this according to the formula the formula which we are given profit after tax and interest it's an accounting formula but yes you will see there is it's true obviously that there's a relationship correlation between the earnings and their wealth earnings to the share definitely if the earnings to one shareholder increases means their wealth has increased right there's a correlation but it's not equal that's what you have to know about eps now coming to the illustration profit after tax number of shares in issue okay so profit after tax is 190 from your income statement okay and uh, what is the number of shares in issue it is how are you going to get the number of shares in issue if you are seeing in the statement of financial position you will see 1200 but they have told in bracket 50 cents shares so 1200 divided by 50 that's how much 2400 that's why 2400 okay so if you see it is in sense they have told you so that's why it is 7.92 and 7 it has increased that means it's good so the eps is an improvement on the prior year how much was that growth if you can see 7 and 7.92 how do you how do we calculate the growth formula is find the difference between two the 7 and 7.92 which is 0 0.92 divided by the previous years which is 7 so 13 percent it has improved by 13 percent which is again you have to compare this with the industry average because you are given the industry average if you see in your income statement below okay i have the income statement with me right now in front of me so they have they're saying the income statement is eps from 12 from 8 to 12 percent it has increased but this is 13 percent even higher than 12 percent which is good which is better than they are performing better in terms of eps next price earnings ratio eps and pe ratio are linked you have to be good in both of those ratios even in afm is related it's, it's needed very much needed so a pe ratio what does it do it gives a basic measure of the company performance it expresses the amount now if you see here also they are talking about the company performance there also when we studied profitability ratios they are talking about performance what is the difference why it is un under investor ratio the reason is because price earnings ratio eps price earning ratio dividend yield all these ratios are used by investor because by looking at this they will decide whether they have to invest or not if it's p ratio is high they will invest otherwise no from the equity shareholder point of view this that's why they are in the investor ratio even though they are measuring the company performance only profitability only if you are saying but it's more than profitability okay so it expresses the amount of shareholders they are prepared to pay for the share the multiple of current earnings the formula could be share price divided by eps or if it's the total share price then it cannot be earnings per share it has to be the total earnings okay that's why total share value total earnings so you see the total total if it's total 
both up and top it will be total if it's not then share price divided by earnings per share simple here also high pe ratio what does it says it indicates that investors perceive the firm's earnings to be of high quality. If you are having a high price earning ratio, that means that what the investor will assume, they will think that your earning is of high quality. High quality means high growth and low risk. It's good, right? If the earnings are of a higher growth, they are growing very highly and risk is also lower, then it's a good combination. About the PE ratio, before we go to the illustration, okay, there are some things which you need to know. If the PE ratio is high, what does it mean? It also means that investors expect profit to rise. Investors expect profits to rise if the PE ratio is high. But you also have to be aware that not all high ratio means that the companies are performing very good, right? Not all companies on high P ratios are expected to perform in the high standard, right? Maybe they have that growth of potential. Why? Because they might be coming from a very low base. Maybe they have just started. That's why that growth rate is very high. Initially, we all know that product life cycle only that growth rate would be very high in the initial years when you're the new in the market but later on when you have matured in the market then the growth rate will be slow so that would be a reason why that growth is very high right next we are coming to the illustration share price divided by eps eps earnings per share just now we have calculated if you see here share price divided by eps earnings per share we have calculated that means if we are want to find the pe ratio price earning ratio make sure that you have calculated your earnings per share already before you calculate p ratio so p eps we have calculated it 7.927 but share price is 130 and 126. let us get the share price it has been given to you 1.3 and 1.26 so 1.3 into 1.3 okay it is in cents right that's why you have to convert it in cents remember your share price is in dollar your eps is in cents so either you have to make your eps in dollar or you have to make your share price in dollar so in cents so it's better to make the share price in cents rather than making eps in dollar then it will be confusing because it will be then 0 0.0792 right so convert your share price which is in dollar into cents how do you convert into cents 100 cents is one dollar so multiply by 100 1.3 into 100 1.26 into 100 that's why 130 and 126 divided by this eps now eps is in cents share price is also in cents 130 cents means 1.3 dollar so it's easier for you to divide always when you have to divide okay for division it comes not for multiplication when you have to divide this is the basic principle you have to keep the your units in same your units has to be same you cannot divide dollar by cents or cents by dollar it needs to be either both dollar or both cents then only you can divide and this p e ratio is in terms of number of times okay 16.4 times 18 times higher the number of times better it is so if you have seen it has not improved it declined okay so investors are willing to buy shares in company at 16.4 times last year's earning compared with previous year why this fall? This fall may be because the company is not expected to grow as much as in the previous year. Can you see? The growth is not as much. So the industry average PE ratio increased on year on year from 20 to 22. Check out your PE, industry PE ratio from 20 to 22. Here, if you see, it is 16.4 even below the industry average. That means the company is generating slower return. And it carries more risk than the industry average also because it's below the industry average. Where is 22 and where is 16.4? Can you see? That's why. Next, we have dividend per share. Okay. 
Dividend per share helps individual and ordinary shareholders see how much of the overall dividend payout they are entitled. So, total ordinary dividend divided by total number of shares issued. Okay. It is usually given in the company's financial statements. So, dividend per share. So, what was the dividend for the period? It is 90 and 50. The ordinary dividend. And then total number of shares issued. Same, 2400 Okay, and this is also in cents. So if you see from 5 to 3.75, it is falling, which is a bad news. Why? If it was the right issue, the shareholders will now each own a greater number of shares. It is not given incomplete, but if it falls down, it's not good. Okay, that means the dividend they are receiving per share is lower now for the shareholder. So now, why it's not good? Because shareholders who are there, they are the owners of the business. So they are entitled to that dividend. The dividend is the share of their profit, right? So if that is declined, that means they are share of profit has declined for the ordinary shareholders how will you explain this this is achieved by paying the amount out as a dividend because the share of profit you get through dividends only right And falling DPS, dividend per share, is a sign of a problem. That means the shareholders are not receiving enough dividend or enough share of their profit. So, as a result, what does company do? They try to maintain a stable and a slowing rising dividend per share. They want to maintain that stable dividend per share or slowly rising. How do they do that? How do they maintain that? By resisting making high payout during particular good years. That means during good years. When the company is having enough profit, what do they do? They don't, they don't pay dividend. They keep it. They reinvest it in the company and in the bad time, when the company is not able to generate such profit, then they pay out that dividend. Because in the good time only, you will have enough to reinvest. That's what they do and maintain their dividend per share. Next. Dividend cover. Uh, let me see. Uh, I think dividend cover and dividend yield. I think there are two more ratio. Let me check it. And total shareholder return, yes. So dividend cover and dividend yield and total shareholder return. Three more to go and then we are over. I know this is a very long lecture and you must be tired by now. But then I would advise you to take a break and then uh, watch this video rather than watching it at all one shot. Right? Before you get tired. Keep your mind fresh before you watch this video. So Dividend cover. Profit available for ordinary shareholders divided by dividend for the year interim plus final. If it's the dividend for the year, if it's interim is given plus the final also. And since it's dividend, dividend is paid to ordinary shareholders. So profit available for whom? For ordinary shareholders, not all. Only for ordinary shareholders divided by dividend for the year. It is a measure of how many times the company's earnings could pay the dividend. How much of the earnings you can use to pay the dividend. Higher the cover, the better because you can maintain the dividend if profit drops, right? If the cover is high, that means even if the profit drops, you can maintain that dividend. But you have to see this in the context of what, how stable the company's earnings are. Because a low level dividend cover, it might be acceptable in a company with a very stable profit. Let's say if the profits are very stable, that time low level of dividend cover is acceptable. But if the same level of cover in a company with a volatile profit, that puts dividends are at risk. Because buyers of high yield shares want to have a stable income, dividend cover is an important number of income oriented investors. Okay.
So this is the illustration for the dividend cover. It is profit for the shareholders divided by dividend. So dividend has been given and profit for share, which is your uh, profit after taxation. Okay. Because profit after interest and tax only will be for the dividend ordinary shareholders. So that divided by dividend. If you see it has increased from 1.4 to 2.1, which is good or bad? Which is good. The profit for the ordinary shareholder, remember it is taken after deduction of preference dividend, but we are not given any information about the preference dividend, so we can leave it. Okay, so the cover represents what security for the ordinary dividend. How secure the ordinary dividends are. In this company, company the cover is reasonable. Okay, now coming to the dividend yield. The next measures are direct measure of the wealth received by the ordinary shareholder. Annual dividend per share expresses an annual rate of return on share price. So if you see for dividend yield, we need to first we need to calculate DPS dividend per share. Then only we can calculate dividend yield divided by market price per share. So it is it can be used to compare the return with that from the fixed rate investment. Okay. Mm. One disadvantage is there. What is the disadvantage? It, the disadvantage of dividend yield is it fails to take account of any anticipated capital growth so does not represent the total return to investor. Because total return includes both the revenue, the income growth and capital growth. But this only takes care of income growth, not capital growth. That's why it does not represent total return to the investor. The dividend yield fails to take into account. Illustration. Before we go to the illustration, let us know some more about dividend yield. Okay. Dividend yield, when can we use this? This is used mostly when we have to take a decision whether we have to buy or sell shares. Okay, because investors, we know they are concerned about what amount of cash, how they are making. It's considered, it's related to wealth, right? That means amount of cash. So the cash is the result of dividend received or proceeds when the shares are ultimately sold. But as I told you, the disadvantage, dividend yield, it is incomplete in itself. Why? Because it ignores the capital gain of the share, which most shareholders would expect. Shareholders expect both income growth and capital growth, not just one. But dividend yield excludes that it does not include the capital growth. That's why it's incomplete. So a better measure would be total shareholder return. That's why from here we go to the next one, which is the last one, total shareholder return. But before that, we'll go through this illustration. DPS, we have just calculated it. 3.75 and 5 and market price per share is given. We have calculated 130 cents, right? It is in cents. That's why we are taking in cents. This is in terms of percentage. If you say it has declined, what does it mean? It may compare unfavorably with interest rates, but it's not a full measure of company performance as investor will only benefit from an increase in share price. They will also benefit from increase in share price. Okay, so as stated before, the low DPS may well be in part because of the recent share issue and this will also clearly impact the dividend yield. Okay. Because higher your denominator, if you see because of the reason share issue, what happens? Your denominator becomes higher, the total answer number becomes lower. That's why you can see. Next, total shareholder return, and this is the last. This is the last for this. Okay. So this measures the return to the investor by taking account of what dividend income and capital growth i've told you total shareholder total the word total includes two things one is dividend income one is capital growth so the formula is dps that means dividend per share plus change in share price divided by share price at the start of period okay 
okay why dp is dividend per share because it is the dividend income and capital growth is capital growth comes from change in share price that's why you add both then you divide the share price at the start of the period so the tsr makes comparing returns between investments simple irrespective of the size of underlying investment it makes it the investment simple to compare the returns okay no matter what is the size of the investment and this is probably one of the best measure of returns to equity the total shareholder return because it takes into account both the dividend income paid to the shareholder and also the capital growth of the share right so the tsr from an investment can easily be compared with when companies are benchmarked against industry or market returns without having to worry about the differences in size you don't have to worry about the sizes of the businesses this you can easily compare for mm. some more let me read the notes because some of the notes i haven't included here because it will be too much i'm just explaining you briefly and another important thing which you have to remember is the actual return which is received by the investor right it will depend on what it will depend on the shareholders income tax and capital gain tax why how does tax come into the picture why income tax and capital gain tax because if it's a dividend income we have to pay income tax if it's a capital growth we have to we have to pay capital gain tax right if let's say capital growth we have to pay capital tax we have, whichever is more we'll see what is it we have to see the tax also income tax we have to pay on the dividend income so we have to see which what type of tax the shareholders prefer whether they prefer high dividend income or high capital gain if they have to if they prefer high dividend income remember they have to pay high income tax if they prefer high capital growth remember they have to pay high capital gain tax and also it depends on their tax position tax position of the individual whether they are the low income tax middle or the highest level because remember the highest level tax they have to pay 45% tax income tax if they have to pay but for the capital gain tax it is what what is the percentage what is the highest percentage 18 or 18 or 28 18 or 28 so 28 is the highest okay so the tsr can also be calculated as the dividend yield how based on the opening share price plus the capital gain over the year so opening share price plus the capital gain over the year will give you what dividend yield next we have the illustration so if we assume the share price was 1.2 remember we need one year the previous opening share price so for 2005 the opening share price will be the share price of 2004 the closing share price of 2004 that's why they have given us here 1.2 assume it is then how much it will be because we need to find that change so for 2006 dps was 3.75 plus change in share price from 2006 to 2005 130 minus 126 divided by share price at the start of the period which will be not 130 it's 126 because 130 share price is for 2006 that means the closing but 2005s share price will be the share starting share price for 2006 that's why 126 same way for 2005 it will be 5 plus 126 minus 120 the previous year divided by the previous year which is 120 if you see it has declined okay now come into the combining ratios you have to know how to combine ratios sometimes it's needed when present with information on some ratios it is sometimes possible to combine two or more ratios in order to reveal another for example if you see dividend p make sure that you know all this how you can combine pe ratio into dividend cover is equals to 1 divided by dividend yield because sometimes you might be given some ratios and sometimes you have to fill in the blanks 
to get the next ratio it's like that so you have to know which can also be written as how 1 divided by p ratio into dividend payout ratio equals equals to dividend yield if you want to find out how why it is like the break down each of the ratios let's say pe ratio break down the pe ratio dividend cover break down the dividend cover 1 divided by dividend yield 1 divided by break down the dividend yield and see how it is how you are getting it okay next so when tackling a question in the exam if you feel like you are missing a vital piece of information consider what ratios you have been given and the elements that go into each and this may reveal a way forward sometimes they might ask you to calculate PE ratio for example but you are not given anything about PE ratio you are given dividend cover or dividend yield or both dividend cover and dividend yield then by using this formula you will be able to go back and calculate PE ratio it's like fill in the blanks where two three information will be given the fourth item you have to find out that's why combining ratio is very important you have to know it next this is the end of it all this we have discovered here so i want to end this video financial ratios the importance we have covered the importance we have covered the profitability and return we have calculated roc roc formula is given roe formula is given profit margins both profit margin formula is given debt and gearing interest cover interest yield formula is given liquidity c chapter 7 i have included the asset test ratio and current ratio and also three more ratios what are they invest uh, sorry inventory turnover period or inventory holding period data collection period credit payable period okay next we have investor ratio investor ratio there are two types dividend based earning base dividend based dividend per share dividend cover dividend yield see the word dividend based means all the time the dividend is there they are dividend based ratios only for example dividend per share dividend cover dividend yield okay three ratios earnings based earning the word earning will be there earnings per share price earning ratio tsr total shareholder return total shareholder return takes both the dividend also earnings also okay in fact it is the third item it's okay so that's it and uh, if you want to make a summary of this when you remember how to remember the formula you can take this screenshot of it take this in front of you before the exam and memorize it keep it in front of you like this formulas are there for each one it's there included so that's it with this i have completed all the ratios financial ratios which are important next when we cover any ratios we are not going to cover this in depth it's already covered and mind you questions i'm going to cover the questions in this chapter for that that a separate video will be there where i will only be discussing all the questions on ratios all the questions because the theory part the concept i have cleared here i have covered in this video and upcoming is non-profit organization that is the last topic under your section a which is what is section a don't tell me you forgot by now what is section a the function of financial management right financial management function that is section m because before we go into the next section section b which is your financial management business environment a small topic is there it's not so big so before we that this is the last non-profit organization what is the objectives how we are going to set objectives okay what are the objective setting how different it is how do we value measure the performance there all these things we are going to cover non-profit organization very important topic so that's it for this video and see you in my next video. Take care.